want to speak this morning um, on the discourse dealing with the crushing pain dealing with the crushing pain first Samuel chapter 29 verse 1 through verse 10 the Bible says then the Philistines gathered together all their armies at Athek and the Israelites encamped by the fountain which is in Jezreel and the lords of the Philistines passed in review by hundreds and by thousands but David and his men passed in review at the rear or at the back of Achish then the princes of the Philistines said what are these Hebrews doing Say that with me. What are these Hebrews doing? Say that with me. What are these Hebrews doing? Say that one more time. What are these Hebrews? So they recognized them. And Akish said to the princes of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel, who has been with me these days or these years and to this day i have found no fault in him since he defected to me since he defected to me amen there's nothing wrong but the princes of the philistines were angry with him with akish so the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make this fella return. That he may go back to the place which you have appointed for him. And do not let him go down with us to battle. For what reason? Lest in the battle he becomes our adversary. For with what oh my god for with with what could he reconcile himself to his master if not with the heads of these men or our men is this not david of whom they sang to one another in dances saying so has slain his thousands and david his ten thousands then Akish called David and broke news to him and said, Surely as the Lord lives, you have been upright, and you're going out and you're coming in with me. In the army is good, is good in my sight, for to this day I have not found evil in your eyes. The day of your coming to me or since the day of your coming to me nevertheless the lords do not favor you nevertheless the lords do not want you they don't want you david so it is not me akish has got a problem with you because we get along so well but my lords do not want you you will listen to what David will say. The verse 7 says, Therefore, return and go in peace, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So David said to Achish, But what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servants? As long as I have been with you, that I may not go and fight against the armies of my Lord the King. Then Akish answered and said to David, I know that you are a good you, you, you are as good in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, not me. The princes of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Verse 10, now therefore, rise early in the morning with your master's servants who have come with you 
And as soon as you are up early in the morning and have light, then depart. Father, bless our word and bless your word. Bless our hearts and bless our spirits. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, we are dealing with a subject, dealing with a crushing pain. First of all, before we come to this moment uh, in the scripture, David is, is moved to live with the Philistines who were by nature eternal enemies of Israel. Much of what Israel did was going back and forth fighting the Philistines. You also want to recall the, the song that the lords of the Philistines quoted here was sung when David killed a Philistine Goliath. And you know how life is sometimes, and I want to speak to your heart today. Life sometimes can cause you to find refuge in a place that you never anticipated. Life will push you so hard that you go and live amongst pigs, amongst the uncircumcised Philistines, as David called them. Remember when he stood before Goliath, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? But now life has thrown David in the land of the uncircumcised Philistines. And suddenly David has, has tilted his tongue. He's calling now the lords of the Philistines as my king. The one's enemies have become kings to him. But also, as he lived in Philistine, this, is, this was the activity of David. By inclination and by attachment, David was still a Hebrew boy. His loyalty was still to the sovereign God. As a matter of fact, what has brought David to live amongst the Philistines is King Saul. Because King Saul doesn't want to see David. David is a threat to the king. So David flees from the covenant land of God to go and dwell amongst the heathens, amongst the enemies of God. And I want to say, ladies and gentlemen, that it is very dangerous to interpret God in one incidence or one situation. I'll say that again. It is dangerous and it will always be wrong for you to try and define God based on one act. Because... Ooh, when you look at God, you are looking at the creator of everything. Let me go further and say, as you look at God, you are looking at the one who made everything, believers including unbelievers. That's why he says, the earth is his. Not only that, but he goes on to say, and Everything in it, including unbelievers, including the Philistines. So, if you think God will only work with the Jewish people, you are mistaken. You are mistaken. Because you cannot put God in a box. You cannot cage God. He is God. I also want to remind you, that the people who get on your nerves and the people you don't like, the people you call witches, you call, whatever you call them, God loves them. And he is so protective of them. He, he, he flourishes them with his blessings because 
they are his. Also, let's settle that Satan didn't create anything. He never created any human being, including witches. Satan never created them. God created them, but Satan made them witches. Amen, witches. So when you look at God, you are not dealing with Cyrus, who is limited to the five senses. I am limited. God is unlimited. In the imagination of David, he never thought he would ever find refuge amongst the Philistines. But again, something goes on to, to surprise me, Mr. Chavula. How did the Philistines, please help me understand this. Because David had killed Goliath. They know this. So David is one, is the number one enemy of Philistine. But how did David find favor to go and live amongst his enemies? And still they don't kill him. Are you with me? Listen up, listen up, listen up. When God is working on something, he uses everything. That is why David, after he's grown, then he comes to say, the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not be in want. Let me skip. He prepares a table for me in the presence of the Philistines. Daniel was thrown in the midst of the Philistines, the lions, but the Philistines, the lions, did not hurt him. So what God does is, when he throws you in a situation, he shuts the mouths of lions. For a moment, the hard drive of the faculties of the Philistines was corrupted with a virus from heaven. That they forgot that this is David who defeated us. This is our number one enemy, the man that we have always sought to kill. And he was there. But making matters worse, the scripture that we have just read, in fact, before I come to this, the way David now lived in, in Philistine, he would sneak out, go and attack the enemies of Israel and come back, I better. Then, making matters worse, Philistine is about to go to war against Israel. Guess who is amongst the fighters in the camp of Philistine? David with his 600 men. Going out to fight against King Saul and Israel. Now, I want you to come with me. Why is David in this situation? And David was ready to go and fight the armies of Israel. Because he was dispositioned. He was inconvenienced. He was distracted. So he decided to join the armies of Israel. Because the people he lived for, the people he was supposed to sacrifice for, had rejected him. Jesus said, I came for my own, but my own rejected me. So David now is passing. I think it was a march pass, whatever they call it. So while the Philistines are passing, then all of a sudden, the Philistines, the hard drive now has been repaired. Now they notice who passes. David and they said, wait a minute, who is that guy? Who is that guy? And then Akish says, this is David. They said, you are out of your mind. How do you expect David to be on our side when we go to fight against his own people? 
And maybe you have forgotten something, Akish. David has already been anointed as king over those people. Do you think he will fight them and not us? And then the lords of the Philistines said, you, you, you don't understand divine things. You, you have no idea. We, we, we don't want to be used in this. Would rather send David back to his camp. So that this battle be between us and Israel. So they told David to leave. And David was offended. Was offended. But again, I want to take you back. David had come into close proximity with the king. The king of Israel saw. So, And David is a man who always said, touch not the Lord's anointed. David has always refused to lay his hands on the king. But in this moment, he's pushed too much. And I came to speak to somebody. You feel you've been pushed too much. And you're saying enough is enough. I have held back myself. I have restrained myself. But now I am going to strike. But guess what? In that moment, God will even use unbelievers to control you. So what the Philistines said was, David, you cannot fight against the covenant of God. Do I have people in the house of God? David was emotionally, emotionally displaced emotionally inconvenienced so much that he forgot about the covenant with God and he said, I will do it anyway. And then God did not speak to David. He spoke to the Philistines and said, do not allow David to stand in the way of God, to stand in the covenant of God. For David will soon be king over his people. He cannot raise his hand against the covenant of God. So God used the enemies of Israel to speak to David. And they withdrew David from the army. But David did not see it that way. David was more upset because he's been rejected already by King Saul. And now he has come to find acceptance here. He feels rejected again. Sometimes what you perceive to be rejection is guidance. You have no idea. Because when God is dealing with you, uh, you, you got to understand that it is not just that one moment of life that is explaining the full counsel of God over your life. No, 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 no. No. He felt rejected. We can go back actually and look at how many times David has been rejected in life. First of all, in his own house, he was rejected. Remember, when, when, when Samuel said, I, I, uh, I have been sent by God to anoint a king amongst your sons, Jesse. And Jesse paraded his sons. David was not invited to the anointing parade. He was rejected by his own father. Until Samuel said, none of these. You don't have any other son. Then he said, yeah, I have one, but he doesn't qualify. That's why we didn't invite him here. And then Sammy said, I, I, I like, this is the part I like, and I can preach on this forever. Sammy said, bring, at this moment, David is in the bush. And you know when shepherds are feeding the, the animals, they are not just in one place. They will feed, they move. So then Samuel says, go bring him. 
Send someone to go and bring him. I'm paraphrasing. And then he says something that strikes me. He says, we will not sit until he comes here. So guess what? The qualified have paraded themselves. They're standing. And then Samuel says, the qualified will be punished. They are in time out. They'll just be standing in the same position. The qualified are in time out. Until you find him wherever he is. If he's in Chimwemwe, if he's in Chamboli, but find him until he gets here, no one will, will sit. You know that God sometimes embarrasses. He, he just embarrasses, especially when you begin to think yourself of the way God does not think about you. So they were embarrassed, and I want to believe it was summer. If it wasn't summer, let it be summer. In the sun, waiting for the rejected to come. And the rejected came. Came. And all of a sudden he found the qualified. First of all, understand, understand. By, by, by tradition of Israel, there was no way David was going to be that. At least the firstborn. Think about the eye of Eliab. And then Samuel comes and says, this is the king. How did they feel? Not only that, then they come to the battlefront. The Eliabs are there. The Philistine, the Philistine comes up. David says, I think I need to understand what's going on here. So David begins to inquire, what, what's going on? And then Eliab heard David. <laughs> You thought we forgot what you did to us. You took the anointing. And then Eliab says to David, David, I know your pride. No, he's not proud. He's just anointed. <laughs> amen. Amen. I'm not proud. Okay. I'm not proud. I'm just a preacher. You understand what I'm talking about? Because sometimes when someone gets to a particular level or particular stage in life, you think they are proud. Now, listen. A CEO of a company gets more money than a get man, a god. So, by implication, you think they are proud. No, they are not. Are you understanding? And I also want you to know that in life, we are not the same. Please understand this. And this is the problem that we have. Because some of you would have a problem. A problem over the water that is in front here. This, to some of you, can cause you to leave church. There is segregation in that church. How come those I don't, whatever they think of themselves, they are the only ones who are given water, not us. We need to be equal. No, we are not equal. I'm just being honest with you. We are not equal. It is God who has set authorities and powers and structures. It is God. So if you fail to understand that, you begin to harbor hatred and, and rejection. Thinking people don't treat you well. No, no. In fact, even the Bible says, give honor to whom? Are you in the house? And that is why you recognize that in your company, there are people who drive company vehicles. You don't. Why? Thank you. Because we are not equal. We are not equal. And when you understand this, it begins to settle you. 
to understand that they are things that you cannot change by your attitude, by putting a, a face. If that won't change anything, it is eating you up. So when they saw David, they said, here you come. You thought we are forgotten. You got our anointing. No, Eliab, no one promised you the anointing. It wasn't yours. So then he says, I know your arrogance and I know you are proud. And then he says, with whom? Now listen to the statement. With whom have you left? Le left what? Huh? Come on, help me. What did he say? With whom have you left what? Not just a ship. Little or few sheep. In other words, you don't even qualify to look after 15 sheep. You can only look after a few. And you think you can come here and impose your pride on us. And then David says, Ah, oh, what have I done? Have you ever been in a place where you wonder, you wonder what's going on? You wonder why, why, why they are talking? You wonder why they, they are fighting you even when you haven't said nothing? You wonder why they are uncomfortable with you. You, you? you just wonder. You just wonder. And I want to let you know that there are battles that you don't need to get involved in. Eliab has got battles within himself. Eliab is bitter. Eliab, 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 Eliab. Eliab. And I want to warn you that Eliabs are in church. You may just be sitting next to him. Mrs. Schwender, be careful. You, 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 just, you have no idea. You have no idea who that Eliab might be. They manifest in a, more, in a crucial moment. That's when, and you know what their duty is? To deflect you. To talk you out of your opportunity. That's all they want to do because they don't want you to get there. He's not Eliab yet. Uh, but God prepares opportunities for us. So now David, in all this, he's gone through rejection there. But then he puts his life on the line for King Saul to save the nation of Israel from Goliath. Guess what Saul does? He rejects him again. He throws him out. No. So, King Saul rejects a boy. In fact, let me say this. David knew loyalty. There was no contention in him. But Saul didn't see that. He throws him out and David finds himself amongst the enemies. Can I preach, ladies and gentlemen? Dealing with the crushing pain. There are times in life when your heart gets so crushed because you've been betrayed. You thought you could trust family, but trust, uh, family uh, betrayed you. You thought you could trust your elder, but your elder betrayed you. So you thought you could trust now your enemies because you think that by association, your enemies will come you because they th you think they will think you give them inside the information. They also reject you. So what do you do? What do you do? But now let's go to chapter 30 of First Samuel, verse 1. So in chapter 29, David is rejected, and now he is going back. We pick it up in chapter 30, verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag. On the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, attacked Ziklag, and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and those who were there. 
from small to great. They did not kill anyone, but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city. And there it was. Bent with fire. Their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. First stop there. Stop there. We'll pick it up in verse 4. So after being rejected, David comes to Ziklag with his people, with their faces down. What's next for us? Well, let's just go home. Probably our wives will comfort us if they want to be nagging. As they enter the city, then the Bible says they only saw smoke and fire. Because when David decided to accompany the Philistines to go to war, the Amalekites decided to come and raid the city. So not only is David dealing with rejection, but there is devastation. They did not just carry things that were there. There are people who know complete destruction. They got everything, but they set the city on fire. So now David... Is seeing the smoke and fire going up only to inquire and find out that the Amalekites had come. But property was taken. Animals, but human beings were taken as well. Not only just ordinary human beings, his children and his wives, gone. Have you ever been, I don't know, you know, the Bible says, of course, and we, we sing these songs and we talk about growing from strength to strength. But sometimes there are people who feel like they just grow from one disappointment to another. From one hatred to another, from one rejection to another. Life just seems to be treating you in a particular direction. While the undeserved are getting there, the deserved are always being pushed far, 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 far. And also understand that David did not ask for the anointing. Samuel just came and said, you are the one. And everything that David is going through here is as a result of the anointing. Before the anointing came, I had no problems. And how many times do we think that now that the anointing has come upon me, I am victorious? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. I will decree a thing and it shall be established. I am above and not beneath. Really? <laughs> if you understand the function of the anointing, you will realize that there will be moments when you decree a thing and it will not be established. You will understand that there will be moments when you won't be above but beneath. Because the anointing takes you a particular route that you don't even expect. The, the problem with the anointing does not take you through the easy road that every... Uh, what, what I want to... And the UN, and an anointed people go through. You understand what I'm talking about? The not anointed people go through. For you because you have to go through a particular, and at the end of it, God wants to say, I did it, and he gets the glory. Now. So David is dealing with that, but watch what happens in verse 4. Verse 4 says, Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the widow of Nabal, the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed. Not only for his problems, the Bible says, 
For the people spoke of stoning him. The very people that he went with to go and join the armies of Philistine to fight. The confidence now had risen against him to stone him. If it was in a political, would say the cadres, your own cadres, the ones you were using against someone, they, want, they are the ones who want to kill you now. If it's in church, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> if it's in church, it's this line here. <laughs> Because these are the people that you can talk to in a crucial moment. But now they are the ones who are saying, David, over this one, you are dead. We have followed your foolishness all along. We have left Israel because of you. Because us, we have no problem with a king. It is you. You told us how things are going to be good. Now you have tempered with our families. This one, you are dead. Now they are telling him because few words before that the Bible says David had wept so much that he had no strength in him. Now they want to kill him. And they are demanding, they are putting pressure on David to act without strength. Dealing with a crushing pain. So, what do you do? Because the souls of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and daughters. But David, that's in verse 6, but David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. Not their God, but his God. It is at that moment, ladies and gentlemen, I submit that you have to tap into the supernatural power, not of the common God, but your God. For they that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. It is at that moment that you tap into some power that is not common to everyone. It is at that moment that you remember that the Lord is your shepherd and you shall not be in want. It's at that moment that you remember that I did not qualify to kill Goliath, but God did it through me. It is at that moment that you remember that I did not qualify, but God qualified me amongst my brothers and anointed me to be king. It is at that moment that you realize that your strength is in the covenant of God and not in the circumstances around you. Are you with me this morning? Because time and again, you will find yourself in that moment. Every door is closed. The choir that used to sing songs for you are gone. It is in that moment that you realize that the people who had compassion and sympathy for you have locked the doors on you and you are all by yourself. It is in that moment that you will lift up your eyes to the hills from whence cometh your help. It is in that moment. And I want to tell you that it is not a common place to be at, but it comes in life. If you've never been there yet, I can prophesy by the grace of God, you will be there. Because this is called life. It happens. Solomon knew it. He says the race is not to the swift. No, the battle to the strong. No bread to, 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 to the wise, whatever. But time and chance happens to them all. So now, in that moment, the Bible says, David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. Verse 7, then David said to Abiathar, now, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a play game. Now, in this moment, David must know who to engage because this 
has turned into something beyond human power. So he's not going to engage these fighters. He's not going to engage anybody else. So David just says, all right, at this moment, I will reach now into my supernatural pocket. So then David said to Abiathar the priest, Abimelech son, please bring the ephod here to me because the battle is not mine, but the Lord's. Bring the ephod here because what they have done, I cannot undo. So I'm going to engage somebody with power to undo what is impossible because what is impossible with man is possible with God. Bolayachinja, bring me the, the ephod. Bring it here. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God answered and said to him, Pursue, for you shall surely overcome them. And without fail, recover oh. it's in a crushed moment and nobody amongst his companions amongst his troop amongst his elders and deacons his associates are going to tell him anything because they are all wounded they're all crushing you may be in the company of people that you have trusted but you come to the point when you are all wounded you are all crushed you are all bleeding they can't say anything to you because they are emotionally disengaged they are spiritually distracted but in that moment you lift up your if he does not work through me I am done and so he says bring me I remember before uh, the, the, the prophet Samuel died he used those things they worked bring them here I want now to connect not with Samuel but with the God of Samuel because Samuel was just a servant. I want to tap into his God. His God who provoked me when I was 17 years old and told me that you're going to become king. I was not part of the parading staff, but he brought me from the bush to come and be here. I never started this battle. So bring the God of Samuel. Bring the God of Samuel. And then David now speaks to God face to face. And probably if I'm not mistaken, this is the only time, the first time, we notice that God spoke to David directly. All along, David was covered by Samuel. But Samuel in chapter 28, 28 there, 27 he's dead remember when king Saul went to wake him up using a witch Samuel is gone so David now has to dig deep and find this God and this God answered him the Bible says this poor man cried to the Lord and the Lord heard him and delivered him out of all his fears so he digs deep and guess what the Bible says seek and you shall find knock and the door shall open to you ask and it shall be given he digs deep and he hears the voice of God and God says pursue you will overtake and then you will recover not just recover but recover all now, how do you convince an army that has just said, you are useless, what kind of a leader are you? How do you convince them that we can go and fight? Ladies and gentlemen, my assignment to you today is to make you understand that Not everything negative implies that it is finished for you. Because if you fail to catch that, I'm going somewhere, you will give up 
on your dream and your purpose for life. Because, oh, let me say, a negative might indicate the end of a season. A negative also might signal the beginning of a season. But it's important that you realize that some fights are not yours. In life, in order to overcome, you must realize what your fights are. David, because of pressure that he was in, he decided to go and fight a fight that was not his. He decided to join the Philistines in fighting against God's covenanted people. And when you do that, I can guarantee you, no matter how skilled you are, you will not win. So in whatever you're doing, you always have to be mindful and ask yourself, is this fight I'm fighting my fight? Number two, am I fighting the right people or am I fighting the Lord's anointed? Because David is not going to become king by fighting Saul. So is the Lord's anointed. I told you this last week. And that probably gives me more right and, and, and strength to talk about this. I told you last week, when the Bible talks, uh, talks about this in the book of Romans, about authority is from the Lord, honor authority. Uh, those that are over you, those who rule over you, these are civic leaders. I told you last week. I told you last week that the anointing is not on an individual in those regard, because in that regard, because the anointing is over the office. For example, the Bible is telling us to honor those in authority. And it may seem like it's God who put them there. No, God didn't put them there. Not everyone who is in authority was put there by God. But, especially in our, in our country, it's a democratic country. It's not a theocratic country. It is people who put people in authority. Once they step in that authority seat, that seat is anointed. So they are covered by that anointing of the seat. Once they leave, they leave the anointing there. Somebody else comes in and will take it. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? So be careful. Some of the people that seem to be frustrating you may be covered by a level of an anointing. By virtue of position. Not that God has put them there or has, has endorsed them. Are you with me? So you have to really, really understand and be sure not to fight battles that are not yours. Some fights are out of jealousy. And in that moment, just know that God is not involved. You don't like someone and then you begin to pray, Lord, that person, I pray fire. Which fire? And if fire will surely come down, it is from the pit of hell. Satan has heard you. He will send fire. Just know that God does not play ping pong. God is not involved in childish discussions and prayers. Father, father, my father, my father, my father. <laughs> You even change the accent. Mawatu wala punkale is an accent. No. Some fights are out of immaturity. David reached a point of immaturity by now fighting the covenant of God. Because fighting against Israel was going to mean fighting God himself. But David was saved by the Philistines. People who didn't even know who God was. David had earlier learned in life 
that, that it's not every battle that you have to fight. David was fought by Saul for no reasons. But God never allowed David to fight back. There are moments when God says, I will allow certain battles or certain waters just to, to come against you. But God is not saying, fight them. God is not saying, be bitter against that. Because God uses circumstances to prepare us. And God uses your enemies to prepare you. So my Bible tells me that then David went and consulted the Lord. And the Lord answered him in the positive. But when we want to, when we go to talk to God, three answers we should always expect from God. At least one from the three. Number one, yes. Number two, no. Number three, wait. Those three answers. Yes, no, wait. Yes, no, wait. If it's a yes, pursue, and you don't pursue, you'll not see victory. A fight that you need to fight and you don't fight it will result into defeat. Then there is a no. A fight that you're not supposed to fight and you fight it, the end result is defeat. I'll say that again. At the no level, a fight that you're not supposed to fight but you go ahead and fight it, you'll be defeated. Because God did not sanction that. The fact that there is a fight going on does not mean God is saying fight. The third answer is wait. Wait has got implications. Because a wait signals that you have to understand the season. In other words, you will need to act, but not now. So if you are going to act at a particular time, then you need to understand the times of God. So that at the appropriate time, then you can act. Now here is the problem. Because you can act outside God's time, or you don't act in the appropriate time. That is why the sons of Issachar, were, were, were very crucial to the victory and, and the deliverance of Israel because they knew the seasons and the times of God. Wait. So when you are waiting, you have to know that you will act. Because when some of us are waiting, we overwait. And that waiting translates into laziness and slumber. Wake up. Wake up. You are sleeping. Wake up. You have to wait. You're waiting for what? For instructions. But instructions are based on relationship. Because without a relationship with God, you will never know when God has spoken. I, I don't know if I can go this way. But there are some of us who are still fighting here, struggling in Quito, and God has said, it's out, it's over here, move. You are still hitting the rock. And God has said, your season is over, move. Elijah, a prophet who was receiving fresh food from heaven, God says, Elijah, the season at the brook is over. Go. If Elijah had stayed there against God's instruction, the birds were going to cease coming to him to bring food. Because provision moves with season. Your supernatural answer is in the supernatural season of God. 
That is why the Israelites never moved in the wilderness until they saw God move. Because when God leaves, the cover is gone. Then you are exposed now. Foul, foul spirits, evil spirits, familiar spirits who have access to you and will speak to you. And you will act on instructions of evil spirits. So you really have to pay attention. I'll be, I'll be closing just now. So never pursue what's not yours. But again, don't give up on your battles. Because your battles, you need to fight them. You need to fight them. But you must know when to fight them. That's why David, now David is a warrior. David is a man of war. But he understood that it's not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. So all along my victories have been by the Lord. If I go by my power and my strength, I will be whipped. Ask Joshua. They went to Ai and they were whipped. They came back running. Why? Let me say, not every negative is meant for punishment. But why would God allow negatives to happen? Number one, to grow our patience. Number two, to train us for battle. Number three, to grow our dependence on him. But then, what's the purpose of battles? And I'm closing with this. I want to remind you that battles create opportunities. Number one, for the judgment of your enemies. Number two, for your promotion. Those two things. Because in the battle, hear me, in the battle, God is using you to execute judgment on those people. Are you understanding me? And God is not executing judgment because you don't like them. It is God's business, not your business. So you go and fight. When God judges Philistine, it is not for David's sake. It is for his name's sake. When God judges Egypt, it is not for Moses' sake. It is for his name's sake. Because before Moses was born, God had said to Abraham, your descendants will be carried into, into, into exile or into slavery. And they'll be there for 400 years. So it has got nothing to do with Moses. And I want to remind you, child of God, that some of the battles we find ourselves fighting have got nothing to do with us. Because this thing started a long time ago. God started pursuing his eternal purpose. God just brought us on the scene to be a contributor to the whole picture of what God is doing. What you find today and what is annoying you and you, you are, it, is, it may have nothing to do with you. Remember, we all move in the cycle of God. And when your time is over, someone else who's been appointed to carry on from you will come up and move on. This is the kingdom of God. And that is why I was reminding you last week that yes, it is important to have property, to have, to have uh, cars. It's important to have good accounts. It's important. But remember, while you are having all that and while you are working so much for that, remember that these are temporal things. These are temporal things. They are eternal benefits that you don't need to pay less attention to. We, were, we are guided in scriptures to be mindful of eternal investments. Where thieves and uh, and Jabakos wait will not get there to steal. Our brothers from Eastern Province. You have to be mindful. You have to be mindful. This reminds us that we are just passing. Today, Peter, 